I am Dr. Manoj Pahukar. I will be convening this uh, today's session. I am very proud to say that uh, this is the 25th episode of this Young Surgeon Forum YSF series, which was started almost 14 months back. It was originally devised to give the young orthopedic surgeons academic platform to showcase their work on this global network. So uh, it was originally conceptualized by Ortho TV along with uh, Dr. Vasudev Gadigune, who is an MOA president. So we do have initial first 24 episodes with uh, eminent institutes as well as uh, various association and orthopedic societies, including the All India Institute of Medical Sciences and Ganga Hospital as well. In the initial 24 episodes, uh, we are lucky to have around more than 130 cases along with uh, the speakers who were given this opportunity to present this work. Uh, I must thank uh, all of them uh, for their contribution uh, for this Young Surgeon Forum. This is basically a case-based uh, discussions uh, or learning uh, platform uh, which we'll be having. So we are very fortunate for this 25th episode of this uh, YSF uh, MOA series. We do have Akala Orthopedic Society as the guest uh, association. And uh, it has been uh, uh, moderated by Dr. Milin Saudari. I think he doesn't need any introduction for the all orthopedic fraternities. Mm -hmm. He will be moderating uh, this today's session and he has conveyed this uh, uh, session episode within a very short notice. And we do have young dynamic, uh, more than uh, uh, like uh, all uh, young budding orthopedic surgeons from Akola, six uh, presentations uh, for this today's episode. We do have Dr. Kiran Sauji, who will be representing from the MOI as an executive as well as a panelist. And Dr. Vasudev Gadigune is always there along with Dr. Karne, who is the MOI secretary. So I welcome you all uh, for this, uh, this today's uh, YSF series where we'll have uh, this Silver Jubilee special edition, six cases from uh, different specialities of orthopedics. And uh, now I'll uh, ask Dr. Vasudev Gadigune sir to give a brief introductory welcome for this uh, 25th uh, special episode of YSF Young Surgeon Forum. So good evening to everybody, viewers of Ortho TV and all members of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. Today is the Pula Day. Happy Pula to all orthopedic surgeons. I am very much thankful to Dr. Manoj Pahukar, who has uh, single-handedly shoulders the responsibility of running the Young Orthopedic Surgeon Forum of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association Educational Activity. I am also happy that Dr. Kiran Sauji is always with me to celebrate this event of Young Orthopedic Surgeon's uh, webinar. And today it is a very special day. We have a very renowned orthopedic surgeon of a Ilizharu and a deformity correction, that is Milin Chaudhary from Akola. He is acknowledged uh, as a man of deformity correction. And he has a very enthusiastic team of Akola Orthopedic Association. They are very young, dynamic, and vibrant academic people of Akola Orthopedic Association. My endeavor was to bring all district places on the platform of Ortho TV and the form of Young Orthopedic Surgeon Forum of Educational Active of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. I welcome you all, and I also very much thankful to Akola Orthopedic Society for their timely response and a very positive response from all Young Orthopedic Surgeons, and they are going to deliberately deliberate their work in front of all viewers of Artho TV and also to an eye opener for the. Uh, association of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. So here I welcome you all and then I uh, give a mic to Dr. Manoj Pahukar for further producing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akula Orthopedic Association. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank also, you, I thank uh, Ortho TV, Dr. Ashok Sham and Neeraj Bijlani for their continuous support for this uh, series, uh, which we could have. So now I will ask Dr. Milin Chaudhary sir to further uh, moderate this session and start the proceedings. Please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, accept my gratitude, Dr. Uh, Professor Vasudev Gadegone sir, Dr. Manoj Pahukar sir, and Dr. Kiran Sauji, old, old friends of mine. 
Dr. Vasudev Gadegon needs no introduction whatsoever, but I must tell you that living in the district place of Akola, we have taken inspiration from his academic bent of mind and academic achievements from long ago. He's had papers in SICOT from as back when the time when I was just a resident at KM Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Kiran Sauji is an old friend and mentor. Dr. Manoj Pahukar is a colleague from Nagpur since many years. I'm so pleased, I'm so grateful that you've given the opportunity on this occasion of the Silver Jubilee Young Surgeons Forum to Akola Orthopedic Society. And I'm extremely proud that my young and dynamic members have taken up the challenge at extremely short notice. I have a, a fabulous team of five or six presenters. And I want to tell you a couple of things about Akola. See, traditionally, like a few district places in Maharashtra, other than the metros, you know, Akola has been known to be a medical center of repute and has always drained several districts patients. And we've always had high quality medical service. The district hospital in Akola, founded in 1927 or earlier, is one of the largest civil hospitals in Maharashtra. It's now a government medical college. The quality of orthopedic services in Akola has always been high. And you will see the proof of this in my young, wonderful team who are going to present. The other thing I want to tell you all is that the distinction of Akola Orthopedic Society, I must add, is that for the last 15 to 20 years, at least, we have been having an academic clinical meeting every fortnight, which not even very many big cities have. We gather every fortnight. There is a dinner, but there's no alcohol served. There's dinner. And a lot of cases are discussed x-rays in great detail. And this is going on continuously, almost without break. And the result of this, I'm sure you'll be seeing. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker. And I'll be introducing each one as we have. So we have, firstly, let me tell you, we have Dr. Deepak Malokar, very famous and well-known hand and microvascular surgeon. He'll be the first speaker. The second one is Dr. Tejas Vagela, who's a young and dynamic arthroscopic surgeon who's crossing many boundaries and doing wonderful new surgeries, which get great results. The third, we have Dr. Amit Zadha, who's a professor of orthopedic surgery at GMC Akola, the captain of Akola's cricket team, the winning cricket team. We have Dr. Sanjay Sonone, the very dynamic, uh, you know, surgeon, you know, sportsman and a wonderful trauma surgeon. We have uh, the, the fifth member today, we are missing Indrajit, but we're going to have Parth Gavatre, who's a fabulous trauma surgeon trained at, you know, Pune at Sanjati Institute. And we'll end the day with the youngest consultant, junior consultant surgeon, Dr. Ishani, who's going to be speaking to us briefly. So let me now invite Dr. Deepak Malokar to share his screen. As he's doing that, I would like to point out that Dr. Deepak Malokar is an alumnus of KM Hospital, Mumbai. He is a FNB fellowship of the National Board of Hand Surgery from Ganga Hospital. And he, we are very fortunate to have him in Akola with us with this fabulous work that he's doing. Without further ado, over to you, Deepak. And I may kindly request you to stick to the time so that we respect the time given to us by MOA, uh, Gade Gune sir, and uh, Bahukar sir. So eight minutes from now, Dr. Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, Milin sir, for kind introduction. So good evening, everyone. I will be speaking on dorsal fracture dislocations of the radio purple joint. So whenever... Uh, we come across these injuries. One might think that these are comminuted distal end radius fracture and the best and the only way to manage them is to put an wrist fanning external fixator, which can completely screw up this case because these are nothing but the dorsal fracture dislocations of the radiocarpal joint, which in itself is a separate entity and has got classification of its own and needs uh, the every fragment of it needs to be addressed. Uh, <laughs> the characteristics of this injury is there are loss of contact between the carpus and distal radius and the carpus is dislocated dorsally and it is basically a spectrum of pathology involving both the bony and ligamentous structure that stabilizes the radiocarpal joint. So before we move on further with these injuries, let us revise the concept uh, of given by Medoff in 2005 about the key five key <coughs> factor fragments that are generally present uh, in intraarticular communicated uh, distal radius fracture. 
These are dorsal ulnar corner, dorsal wall fragment, radial column fragment, volar rim fragment, and the free intraarticular fragment. So, uh, having revised this uh, concept, let's come back to our original injuries. Uh, so, various attempts have been made to classify these injuries, but the one uh, which is most comprehensive and holistic was uh, given by uh, Dr. Bayandi from Italy. Italy. And this is basically a three uh, CT scan based classification. And he has classified this injury in basic four types. The best part about this classification is that every type of classic, every type, every pattern, uh, like uh, every type uh, has its own approach to be uh, addressed during surgery. So type one is pure radiocarpal dislocation. This is a completely ligamentous injury. And these injuries need to be addressed only volarly. Type 2 are uh, basically again divided into two subtypes. So type 2 uh, injuries have what uh, type 2A have what uh, dorsal capsular, uh, dorsal wall fracture, radial column fracture uh, and type 2B along with these there is also a free intraarticular fragment and these injuries needs to be addressed only dorsally. Type 3 are Along with uh, these injuries have got volar uh, fragment, volar shear fragment, radial uh, column fracture, and dorsally, there are small comminuted fractures of the dorsal wall, which need not be addressed. Hence, these injuries are addressed only from the volar side. And type 4, which is the most severe of this, has got volar shear fragment, has got radial uh, column fragment, dorsal uh, wall fragment and also has got a free intraarticular fragment. So these needs to be addressed volarly as well as dorsally. So having revised this, uh, let us come to the, our cases. So this is a 23 year old male gentleman who had a fall on outstretched hand. He has come to us after almost two weeks. Uh, we had done a traction x-ray and we could get uh, a fair amount of reduction. And here only you can see there is a radial column fragment and he has got a dorsal wall fragment and there is some free intraarticular fragment for which we did a CT scan. And here we can note down, there is a free intraarticular which is lying volarly. Here you can see in the sagittal cuts, the fragment is almost as uh, like dislocated from its place and gone volarly. So basically it's a type 2B fracture where there are three fragments and the approach is always dorsal. So this was approach uh, through dorsal universal approach. Uh, subcutaneous fat dissected. Then third compartment EPL is cut open and following which the second and fourth extensor compartment are elevated superiorly. Once we do all this, we are diagnosed and it was relocated. And this is how the CM looked, intro of CM looked. The radial, uh, column fragment was fixed with multiple K wires and the free fragment was fixed with a small K wire which was passed subchondrally. This was the on table reduction and this was uh, and finally the dorsal uh, wall fracture was fixed with a absorbable suture in a figure of eight manner. This was the immediate post op. This is at around six weeks. And this is the functional, uh, the uh, follow-up at around three years. And that's his function. Orsiflexion, palmar flexion, supination, and pronation. Second case, similar case, dorsal uh, fracture dislocation. Again, same type, type 2B, radial column fragment, uh, inter free intraarticular uh, intra fragment, and dorsal wall fracture. Again, approach dorsally and fixed with multiple K wires. This case was a little bit unstable. So we had augmented this with a wrist fanning external fixator, which was removed at around four weeks. And this is the X-ray at around two years. And that's the function. So summary, so these are complex injuries. Uh, a CT scan is must before we uh, plan for an intervention. Always uh, by seeing multiple fragments, one, may, one should not consider that this should be managed biologically or in a closed manner. Always we have to do an open reduction. 
and as we know type 1 and type 3 needs to be addressed volarly while type 2 injuries have to be addressed dorsally and type 4 are uh, need to be addressed volarly as well as dorsally thank you wonderful thank you very much dr deepak thank Most you sir thank you not only for the excellent cases you have shown but also for really really having the soul of wit that is brevity is the soul of wit thank you very much for sticking to time may i now invite uh, kiran sir to please comment Yes, I want to ask about the volar displacement. Uh, whether he uses volar plate or not. Uh, Deepak, can you stop your screen sharing so that? Sir, actually, I can see only new share. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I got it. I got it. Okay. okay. Sir, uh, the the frac the pieces are very small. No, in these two cases, uh, it's okay. But whether you use or not. Yes, sir. I do use. Okay. Uh, uh, Doctor Manoj, uh, uh, please some comments from you. Yeah, I think it was an excellent presentation in the brief and uh, all well illustrated. So, few questions would I'd like to ask? Are uh, do you need any time? Because sometimes there is a bone loss dorsally, a lot of combination. They are not able yes. to get the height. So, do you need uh, to put sometimes the bone graft? And have you yes, used plates, plates any time dorsally so as to get a good hold and encourage so as to buttress those fragments? Yes, sir. Yes. If like we are using K wires only, uh, then definitely if there is a bone loss, we need to add bone like strut, bone graft strut. But then if you are using plates, then there is the plates are like low profile, then there is no need to use bone grafts. Another one question: See, being a uh, breast surgeon. Uh, whether you use a uh, fixed disc ulnar styloid? Sir, uh, what we will do, like after fixation of the distal radius, we will check for uh, DRUG instability. If it is stable, then we need not fix the ulnar styloid fragment. If it is very much unstable, even with radi wrist uh, radial deviation, that is the time when we sh one should fix the uh, ulnar styloid. After, if there is a instability only, otherwise not. You know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you fix with figure of it or something else? No, sir. Figure of it. Figure of uh, it. Tension band. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sometimes these fragments are so small that you are unable to fix it within the K wire. So nowadays, what they are recommending want to use these suture anchors, the two point eight anchors, and then you can have a good hold of this uh, ligament or this capsule properly dorsally, so as to avoid so any comments on that. Uh, yes, sir. Definitely. Uh, like whenever we are dealing with pure ligamentous injury, that is the time we always have to use anchors. And as you have suggested, even a small fracture fragments can definitely be used with the uh, anchors. Definitely. I have not used personally, but then there is always an option. Okay. So how do you assess that finally you reduce the joint and it is quite stable? Which uh, CM pictures and it sure, uh, dynamic? We will do a dynamic fluoroscopy with wrist in uh, flexion extension, and that time we can assess whether it is stable or unstable. A couple of questions for you, Deepak. Uh, so, do you release the capsule or you are making use of the fragments and elevating the fragments to look at the rest of the articular surface? Um, yes, sir. So there is no need to. Cap. Yeah, there is, because there is a dorsal wall fracture, there is a natural interval uh, where you can go inside and uh, do a reduction. So there is no need to uh, separately incise the capsule. Great. So even the same thing on the volar side, when you take a volar approach for some of the volar ones, you don't need yes, to release the capsule. Yeah, you don't need to release. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, Just a comment that I wanted to add about the CT scan images that you showed. Something that I learned recently by a book from Francisco Del Pinal that uh, the CT scan images can be worked. See, according to Del Pinal, the 3D reconstruction images are almost virtually useless because of various reasons. And he feels that we should use the 3D MPR, multiplane reconstruction mode, in whichever software we have. So the software I'm using is called as Radiant. It costs about three and a half thousand rupees per year. Uh, or you can use Osirix that also sometimes costs a little more. So, uh, uh, you know, so 
there is this feature called 3D MPR in which the, at the same level you can get the you know the the coronal, the the sagittal as well as the actual images all in one screen at the same time, and you can locate free fragments. You can locate the gaps. You can locate where the you know the fracture fragments are going really nicely. You can okay. choose it yourself. So use the 3D MPR. And I've stopped relying on the images provided by the radiologist. I always insist on getting a CD and I open it in Radiant, which is very inexpensive. And I would recommend all of you, my friends, to do that. And hopefully that will add to... Um, Our radiologist opinion may not match with the clinical finding also. So majority of them, they are not very pertinent and particular about that particular region. So their general reading is not very worth for the... Uh, coming to their final diagnosis of any decision making, I think so. Correct, correct. Yes, sir. And uh, just, I, you know, it's they say that one should not add too much to a really already good presentation. Uh, but you've really done a great job, Deepak. Thank and you, sir. Thank you. Really. The only thing is, I would like to say that there is this newer trend after reading Del Pinial's book during the COVID. I've started performing wrist arthroscopy assisted okay. in distal radial fracture reductions. It's a 2.7 mm scope from ConMed, and we use the 6R portal, you know, just rad radial side of the ECU tendon over here, and the 3 4 interval portal, third, fourth compartment interval portal with a very thin. So we can actually see whether we are able to get a good reduction. But Deepak, you have shown very nicely how you lift the entire fragment. So you are virtually being able to see much of the articular reduction. So this is yes, very sir. nice what you are doing. In the absence of wanting to open everything, one way is perhaps to perform. Uh, so I think we'll take two more comments if there are, and uh, I have to take a call. So I think the volar or the dolsa rim plates, uh, which needs a good design to as to fix this fracture is still not properly available. So yes, that sir. still yes. remains a uh, lot of controversy as to how to fix those frag fragments properly. Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, another is like, uh, if there is a only dislocation, uh, so just for the sake of all the viewers, how do you uh, fix it from the uh, type 1 injury, I mean to say? How yes, do you sir. approach from the whole side and what, uh, what is exactly done? Sir, what uh, in type 1 injuries, uh, there is volar uh, ligamentous injury uh, along with dorsal also. But then it is said that one side one has to be addressed and that is volar. So volarly we open it, uh, the avulsion is fixed with the um, uh, anchors and after the repair of the capsule, we have to check for the uh, ligament stability, uh, like stability of the uh, carpus. And if it is not dislocating, then that is the end of surgery. But if it is still dislocating or subluxating, then a radial unit wire can be passed. So that will be enough. No need to open dorsally. I think you had a wonderful presentation, Deepak. I think. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great. Superb. Thank you very much, Deepak. Now, may I invite Dr. Tejas Vaghela to uh, share his screen? And as he is getting started, a few words of introduction would not be out of place. Tejas is a young and dynamic um, arthroscopic surgeon, specializes in the surgeries of the knee and shoulder. He's been with, with us for several years. He's trained in Mumbai. He's a Mumbai boy and he's trained in Singapore. His quest for knowledge is um, very strong. Recently, he's been to New York to update his knowledge. And he's always regaling us with very interesting videos about shoulder and knee surgery. We learn a lot from him. And he is very much active in the Akola and Vidarbha Orthopedic Society meetings. He's presented in IOACON etc as well so without further ado may i request dr tejas to tell us about uh, rotator cuff tear repair and eight minutes for you please thank you go ahead thank you milan sir for an for an introduction i don't think i i deserve that that much kind of praise and uh, any praise coming from you is always inspiring so the 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 talk that I have today is on arthroscopic uh, management of irreparable tears. So just for our own convenience, let's look at what are irreparable rotator cuff tears. They are the ones which have a defect, which is more than four to five centimeters. There's a, a acromiohumeral distance. The name speaks for itself, which is less than five mm. 
a fatty degeneration, which is grade three or four, and a tear retraction, which is up to glenoid. And for all the, the viewers, as well as for a practical standpoint, I also have certain checklists uh, or, or as we call it, the practical things where I see the patient's factors as well to decide whether I want to operate these cases. If a patient has high BMI, they are smoking, they have depressive tendencies or lack, lack of motivation, then there are these red flags where I don't tend to operate them. Just a quick refresher for everyone, the Guthalia classification, the one that we are interested in for this pertaining to this case are grade three and four, wherein you have uh, more fatty infiltration, which is either equal to muscle or it is more than that. Their patterns have been very classically defined by Burkhardt, and the one on the extreme right of your screen is the one which is right now of concern to us, where there is a massive rotator cuff tear, which is retracted, as well as uh, there is a bald humeral head. Pathy is divided into uh, three grades of retraction, and for our interest is the one on the extreme right, where it is retracted to the clenoid. So coming to our case, she is a, a, a 35 year old diabetic patient who had a fall on her right arm. She is right hand dominant. She has almost pseudo paralysis of her right arm. But as you can see, she is a happy patient. She is willing to uh, go for a, um, a lot of hours of rehab post operatively. And uh, that's what we counsel them uh, before our surgery. Even though the patient is happy, but when I look at the MRI, I'm not that happy. You can look at the humeral head, which is significantly overriding. There is a Pathes grade three, uh, grade three retraction. And of course, uh, there is Gotalia's grade four atrophy. So the challenges before I make a blueprint for my case is the patient factors. The age is a little on the longer side. She is diabetic. Of course, there is muscle atrophy. The tear pattern is bad. There is significant retraction. And of course, there are adhesions. So as we make the blueprint, these are the things which go through my mind as I go for surgery, that I want to do a, a good thorough footprint preparation. I need to do adequate releases. Sometimes if I'm not, not able to take it up to the footprint, that I can medialize the repair. There's a technique described by Stephen Burkhardt, which is microfracturing, which releases the egress of the subcondyl bone and causes um, a good amount of uh, healing bed. Of course, you can increase the suture construct by doing a double row or a speed bridge kind of repair. And then there is augmentation or rerouting of the biceps. Now, just a quick uh, refresher again, the biceps are the superior capsular stability. So if I call it in simple practical terms, if you have a door, the hinges are the one which give you the stability and the force is your hand. So in the same way, the stability for the shoulder to have an active elevation is by the net medial and the inferior force, which is by the superior structures. And then the deltoid is the force that lifts its the hand. So this is a concept which was very well undertaken by Korean surgeons. Yongri is the one who pioneered this. They do a routing of the biceps superiorly onto the humeral head. These are some of the uh, descriptions from his paper. Looking at our patient, this is the arthroscopic image you can see the bald head, a large, massive rotator cuff tear. It is retracted. It is poor quality. It is significantly inflamed. You can see it can even tear as we are rotating it, trying to lateralize it. So we do adequate releases with the radio frequency ablator. We have a good bursectomy. We again try to look at the excursion. We prepare the footprint, use an anchor, and now we'll shuttle the biceps superiorly onto the humeral head so that it gets that depressive action. So that's the thorough footprint preparation. Now I'm shifting the biceps superiorly. I'm also trying to see if I can cover with the uh, rotator cuff tendon. That's the biceps tendon completely repaired onto the humeral head. Then we pass sutures from biceps into the uh, rotator cuff. That's me passing the sutures. And then we also repair the infraspinatus and we use another anchor and we repair the infraspinatus as well. Once the repair is completed, you can see it is watertight. We also, as I said, do some microfracturing for egress of the growth factors, which you can clearly see are coming out from the um, microfracturing. And that's the intra-articular uh, intra, uh, image where the humeral head is completely covered by the rotator cuff. If you look at 
at the X on the left, there is acrohumeral distance is decreased, and the Gothic arch maintains postoperatively. And these are few of the patients' function. You can see that the pseudo paralysis is recovered, and the patient has good movement. However, there are some sometimes when the patients have biceps tendon which are torn, or they also have significant biceps tendonitis. So here's another case. Again, this is Pate's grade two to three with grade three fatty atrophy. But when we went inside, we saw that there was significant inflammation of the biceps, and the biceps tendon was partially torn. So for the depressive action, you need the biceps to be completely anchored onto the superior labrum. So you can see here that the biceps tendon is torn. So I did not decide to reroute the biceps. We just sacrificed the biceps here. That is, we did a tenotomy. We went subacromially here. We were able to cover it. only with the rotator cuff so i did not have to use a biceps of of course again biology like any orthopedic surgery you have to have good environment for healing so we do very good footprint preparation we used the anchors we passed those stitches through the rotator cuff tear we saw that we could cover it of course we use 2 to 3 anchors minimum when we are doing a supra infra when we are doing a subscap the the anchors might range as much as 5 here we did a double row so we have done a lateral row here which gives us a classical diamond configuration and again all the steps which were described are followed in this so we again here also do a micro fracturing of the humeral head to get the egress of growth factors that's us micro fracturing and after that again we go intra articularly to see how have we have been able to cover the rotator cuff so we went intra articularly and we could cover the whole humeral head satisfactorily that's the patient again he was also pseudo paralytic as you can see with minimal elevation and that's his 8 month follow up where he has gained enough strength as well as good range of movement so to summarize i think you have to take all the factors in consideration when you are looking at an irreparable or a challenging rotator cuff tears good patient selection is half the battle won excellent outcomes are possible when an irreparable rct is managed arthroscopically all or some techniques which we have just described can be used avoid biceps rerouting if there is a biceps tear or there is significant biceps tendonitis and of course the rehab is a little different you you have to be very nuanced in your rehab you will have to be a little gentle as compared to our normal rotator cuffs where we start them moving adequately thank you thank you dr tejas for this wonderful presentation and sticking to time thank you sir and now request uh, manoj dr manoj to kindly uh, start set the ball rolling yeah. with your comments please yeah. tejas can you just uh, stop your screen sharing yeah sir i'm doing it i'm just doing it. thank you sir excellent technique uh, which you have demonstrated i think it is certainly uh, thank you sir thing yeah and uh, uh, very useful in uh, this uh, irreparable cuff tear so do you decide this uh, pre operatively only with clinical or mri or you yeah. make any changes uh, intraoperatively to decide to go for this uh, bicep reconstruction additionally yeah so sir uh, generally combination of things so if uh, you will have have all the signs of bicep tendinitis the patient has this very classical um uh, all the clinical signs then i i tend to look at not using a biceps but then uh, also once we go inside we keep everything ready uh, and uh, if it is possible then we will repair uh, the rotator cuff only uh, generally again the take home message would be not using biceps for everything 
I mean, here biceps is being used as the foundation, uh, or rather, being used as a a building block to something bigger. But if we can biologically repair the rotator cuff in total, I think that would be a better thing to do. So you are for more for a bicep tenotomy point rather than tenotomy, which is always a question. Yeah. So again, this is a very interesting and and I think that's a very good question. And uh, uh, sir, but again, the answer is different. French surgeons uh, sacrifice it very readily, and American uh, surgeons. Uh, talk about doing tenodesis a lot. Uh, in my practice, I have seen that even bicep tenotomy works because we don't want to increase the cost in a multiple fold for our patients. Anyway, arthroscopy is a little more expensive uh, in terms of implants, so we we'll increase the cost. But at, with that, also we want to provide the patient with uh, less pain. So I would do a tenotomy very readily. I, I don't think that uh, you know in my hands, uh, tenodesis has had a very significant effect uh, for these kind of cases. Ages, I can only say that is a fantastic result of this uh, irreparable cup here. Thank you, sir. Thank you so were smiling in the video. We can see that both patients were smiling. Yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. With full range of movement. Yeah. Uh, and, Thank you, sir. And Ages' confidence of presentation is uh, worth noting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your kind words. So, question from me: How till how late in the presentation after the the injury or the trauma can you operate and do these uh, techniques? How how much delayed presentation can be tackled? Sir, uh, this is again a very technically demanding question for me. I think uh, the longer it takes for the patient to come to surgery for these kind of cases, the tougher it is for arthroscopic surgeons to handle it because the adhesions increase. Here, like we have shown that we have also have to release between the rotator cuff and glenoid. So that increases the operative time, that increases the, um, the, the soft tissue insult. So I think uh, earlier would be better, but uh, we like, we have also done cases who, who have presented after maybe a year or so, and we have been managed, we have been able to manage it with uh, sometimes even just pure rotator cuff repairs or using a biceps. This is further, further to this question. So do you prefer this technique to be more in a degenerative tears if you sometimes uh, want to operate those and not in the traumatic tears? If they uh, early. Yeah. Sir, I would, I would humbly disagree with you. In degenerative tears, I would not do a biceps rerouting because degenerative tears tend to have more tendinitis. They will tend to have more. If you'll go and put your scope into shoulders who are degenerative, they'll have more biceps, which is both. So then the the total uh, depressive effect of uh, biceps is gone for me. So in those okay. cases, I will either do a tenotomy and do a rotator cuff tear, uh, rotator cuff repair, uh, which will be tension free. And it for those kind of patients, but of course we have to counsel them. And uh, in the long run, if the patient is in the same, I operate them. Otherwise, I give them an option of, of conservative management. Okay. Great. Uh, Great, Tejas. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, super presentation. Now, with this, it's my uh, privilege to invite Dr. Amit Jadha, Professor Amit Jadha, to you know share his experience with us about. Uh, he's going to speak to us about non-unions. So, uh, Professor Amit Jadha works at the Government Medical College, Akola. He is an astute clinician. He's a great cricketer and is very understated in his approach to most things in life. But uh, that doesn't make him any less valuable a member of Akola Orthopedic Society. Uh, Dr. Amit Jadhav, please. Thank you. Thank you, Milin, sir. Uh, I think best person to talk on non-union is uh, yourself only. But I will just try to justify the topic. Uh, so this is a 55-year-old uh, gentleman uh, having a road traffic accident. And he was having trauma to his ipsilateral right lower limb. He was having a type 2 compound uh, femur shaft fracture and he was having a close segmental tibia shaft fracture, median malleus, lateral malleus, close injury with tibial platform and there was a heel pad avulsion. So in this case, sir, I have done on day 2, I have done an unreamed close nailing for his femur after debridement of the wound and on day 5, I have done close tibia interlock nail along with ankle fixation.
So this is a six weeks post-op image. There is no significant callus formation at femur as well as tibia. This was 14 weeks means three and a half months post-op. So you can see in femur, this is uh, already dynamized. So at, at three and a half months, I tried to dynamize it again by removing this femur screw and putting one more screw little proximal to it. And I removed the static screw from tibia. But that also didn't help. This is the six months post-op. A scanty callus at femur as well as al almost no callus at the tibia. But at this point of time, patient was having uh, absolutely no complaints in his thigh or uh, leg. He was having just dull aching pain while walking, but he was doing his all his activities with full weight bearing. So this is the picture at one year. Little bit callus formation. Again, patient at this stage, I, I advised him a surgery. He requires a revision surgery, but patient was not too much bothered as he was doing his all daily activities. At 14 months post-op, he came with this picture. There's a scanty callus formation at uh, femur shaft and as well as tibia shaft fracture. So what next? So should I tell what I have done or should I uh, open the case for discussion? I think better to take opinions, I suppose. Yes, yes. We, we could have, all, could have yes. femur, there is a pseudoarthrosis at one, at one year only. Yes, sir. You can see the clear cut pseudoarthrosis. Yes, sir. I so, feel these are the overall well done fixations, both uh, intermediately good splinting nails uh, on both sides. Still, they are landing into some kind of problem. So, is there any bony biology which is also having some issues? So for femur, for femur, I can say that it was compound. Uh, there was a wound just distal to the fracture site. Fracture site was not open to the environment, but uh, through the we can feel the bone through that wound. So it was like type two uh, compound. This 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 is one biological issue we can expect for femur. Otherwise, patient point of view, there were no patient related factors. Okay. Any history of tobacco to consumption? Tobacco, no, 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 no alcohol, no tobacco, no smoking. Patient related factors NSAID, are absolutely uh, NSAID, not NSAIDs, 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 NSAIDs painkillers. Uh, no, sir, he was not having any significant pain. Okay. So, yes, okay. He used to he used to take at at, at times uh, once in a week or once in 15 days uh, ultrasound or something like that. Okay. Okay. Uh, may, I, may I comment, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, please. Uh, it is a unstable construct at both the ends in the femur as well as the tibia. This is a junctional zone fracture which requires a stability which is not provided by a only mediolateral two locking screws and one proximal screw only. It requires an additional thing that is a multi-lock nail from lower down or you integrate nail, but you must have a multi-lock with polar screw in the distal fragment so that the toggling of a two-third and one-third junction is there that is nullified. Because of this unstable construct, there is no callus formation as well as uh, just it is, we can say, oligotropic non-unit yes. type of a thing. It is yes. Yes. the two stability and there is no, I don't think there is a failure in the biology part because there is a, some attempt at callus formation. Even in the distal, it is a segmental fracture tibia as you can see here. The fibula is very quickly united as seen in other cases also. But yes, you can sir. see the stability of the construct in the segmental fracture of tibia also required to have a both ends a very statically and rigidly locked. Here dynamic locking it only helps in the transfer fracture, but not in the mm -hmm. oblique fracture. Dynamic locking will again will produce a cancerous bone locking, which will be unstable construct. So this needs only a stability. May you add a plate and bone graft in both the situation, keeping the nail in situ, or you can do exchange nail, augmentation and probe graft for femur, and exchange nail and uh, grafting at the both the ends, plus whichever the uh, segment unstable while doing a surgery, you can test it under the CR, and probably you can use a small segmental derotation plate for one of the fractures. That is the whole of the treatment. It's not the biological failure. It's only a mechanical failure. 
Yes, sir. Absolutely, I agree with you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Sir, I, I absolutely agree with you for female side, but for uh, tibia, I already locked it statically also. But uh, seeing some uh, gap at the fracture side, I at three and a half months I dynamized it. Otherwise, I had locked it. Two locks were proximal in the tibia, and three locks were there in the distal. Segmental fracture is no issue, Jado sir. It's yes, because sir. one of the fracture may go for non-union. That is yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, 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 yes. sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, for femur, absolutely, you are absolutely correct, sir. For uh, femur. Or tibia, it is a by luck that the patient has not united. Otherwise, it is the fragments are in position. It is a mean semi Good, surgery. So it should have healed. But uh, it is because of the early uh, union of the uh, this fibula, fibula that has yes, prevented sir. the coming together of a fragment, and probably that has also. Uh, not allowed the union to happen. Yeah. So it's a yes. very surgery. Only it requires additional plating and bone grafting if you don't want to change the name. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Gardigone, sir, why there is no loosening of? Uh, do you feel there is any loosening of the femoral nail or uh, the screws? Because you I can see the translation also. There is a virus collapse. You can see at this here. There is a virus collapse. It's seen at the fracture side. Fracture side. Okay. Only, only, only augmentation, only pla plating and bone, bone grafting will not do probably in P1. So we'll have to exchange nailing, bone grafting and plating probably, I think. Yes, yes. Sir, uh, sir what I think, yes, sir. Derotation plate and bone grafting it must not. Yes, okay. yes. Sir, what I think in this, it's, it's not a... It's not an ideal, uh, what we say, a hypotrophic non-union elephant foot type, but this is some way in between this harsh foot and oligotrophic. So there is no abundance callus formation. If there is an abundance callus formation, we can get away with only augmentation plate, I think. But in this case, I think there is there is stability That's issue, as sir has rightly said. But to some extent, there has to be a biological issue also, as it was compound to start with. So what I did, what my plan was to do, as Sir rightly said, remove the nail, clear the fracture ends, uh, put another nail which has to be reamed and uh, size most probably or likely to be two millimeters um, uh, larger than the previous nail, and a derotation augmentation plate and a bone grafting. So what what pre op planning you need to execute this plan? As previous nail was an unreamed and eleven millimeter. So I was likely to uh, keep 13 millimeter nail available, which are usually not uh, available in routine sets. So I have specially ordered 13 by 400 and 13 by 420 millimeter from the company. And for the same, you need 13, 14 and 15 millimeter reamers, which are usually not available with everybody for this case. So I have done this uh, as per my plan. So I, I want to share one important intraoperative step that in lat usually we do this procedure in lateral position. So there are high chances of rotational malalignment. So to avoid rotational malalignment, a single vertical marking either with a saw or a K-wire multiple holes should be made as a straight line across the fracture site before removing fibrous non-union tissue. Because once you remove this fibrous non-union tissue, the, the fragment starts moving and there is nothing to match the rotation. So I think this is the most important step, uh, which I learned the hard way. This is the post-op X-ray at three and a half months. This is the post-op X-ray at five and a half months. It is nicely consolidated. And this is the X-ray at five years post-op. And luckily, a tibia, I have not done anything. I have neglected it, sort of. And tibia is also as united without any intervention. He has reasonable knee, hip, and ankle movements. He has two centimeter shortening, so he walks with a uh, short limb gait, but otherwise he is asymptomatic. So take home message is what sir has rightly said. You have to be very alert if it's an infraisthmic fracture in case of shaft femur. Thickest possible rim nail should be used. A longest possible nail should be used. A bidirectional or multidirectional Distal locking is desirable in such fractures to avoid toggle. This is, these are the take-home messages for primary fixation. A good pre-op planning is must for a non-union case. Rotation must be marked on bone before removing fibrous non-union tissue. Uh, augmentation plating combined with the exchange nailing is a reasonably good and effective procedure with very high success rate.
sir i have two short cases if time permits me uh, should i should i should i proceed uh, so I, i will i will ask manoj dr manoj please to tell whether uh, this is okay because or should we discuss this in greater detail or can you have one more case i think we can have it's a non linear case the similar kind of for a... yes sir yes, yes i will finish it in 2 minutes okay i think that we should we can have okay it. dr amit please yes sir thank you <laughs> So this is a 25 year old male fall from bike as per history it was a close injury without any distal neurovascular deficit this was managed somewhere else but there was intraoperative complication while putting a intramural there there is a fracture at the proximal uh, humerus as well as there is a butterfly and very fracture at the distal part of the humerus as well this was a picture at 3 months post operatively and this was a picture at 4 months post operatively when he presented to me after index surgery the proximal screws are broken the nail is also broken so in that case uh, i have removed the nail i have not tried to remove this broken uh, uh, screws i have taken a posterior approach uh, i have debridded the uh, bony ends as the distal fragment was funnel shape i jammed the proximal fragment into the distal fragment and i fixed it with a rigid fixation with distal humerus extra articular locking plate and a bone graft this was a picture at two months post operatively i had two months almost all my bone graft was looking resolved and i was little worried but uh, patient lost for follow up and started working and he came at six months with this picture with completely consolidated fracture site with almost full elbow and shoulder movements there is one short case one more short case is there this is a 42 year old male road traffic accident close distal tibia comminuted fracture this was fixed somewhere else and he came at 4 months with a broken nail and he was having a deformity and pain while walking he was walking but with difficulty so in this case this was a deformity so i have uh, approached this fracture because i have to remove the distal two medial screws through a medial incision thick flaps were uh, taken the nail was removed proximally and distal broken end and it was a fibular osteotomy was done and it was fixed with a medial distal tibia locking plate with autologous bone grafting and this was 4 months post op it was nicely consolidated and he was obvious he was no having no obvious deformity post operatively this was his ankle movements and this was his gait at 4 months post operatively thank you super this is really wonderful thank you very much uh, professor amit really nice cases with nailing and plating sort of day to day cases that you can see as a tra- in a in a trauma practice really well done nothing much to add only thing i could have said the femur case which generated such a lot of discussion at the end you said that there was a little bit of shortening the only thing that i can add is that the what i could have done little differently was i could have added a little bit of length there are two ways of doing this in with intramedullary nailing one thing is a double level fixator assisted nailing which i published in british jbj in 19 uh, 2019 in which we have a thick nail which is a straight nail it's not a curved trauma nail and with there are extra holes in the center we can perform an osteotomy a little above lock the non union site through the hole so there's adequate stability and then also lend them those one or two centimeters that can be done which i have or the other thing is what what is described in japan since the year 2006 as chipping and nailing treatment in which at the at the non union site this works in all aseptic non unions this is like bringing what professor matsushita says is like bringing the bmps out into the four they perform a chipping with a stout osteotome and a hammer it takes almost half an hour to make multiple chips sort of bag of bones at the non union so it creates a fresh hematoma and brings in the fresh hematom you know poietic factors and then you can just put in a nail if you don't want to lengthen you know that itself according to him so this is a new concept a relatively new concept popular amongst surgeons who perform limb reconstruction and lengthening but you could we could try it at some point in time you know any of us could want to try this so thank you very much um, dr amit excellent cases thank you sir. thanks a lot so now uh, it's my privilege to invite dr sanjay sonone from uh, you know trauma surgeon from akola sanjay are you there um uh, is sanjay there is parth there parth gawatri or sanjay hello sir yeah sanjay is here great lovely please share your screen 
And as you're doing that, may I introduce you? Sanjay is a very experienced trauma surgeon, senior trauma surgeon from Akola. He's very dynamic in nature. So he's a sportsman and he, he's a he, he's a, a complete trauma surgeon. It's always his presence in clinical meetings is very lively. And uh, there's much to learn from him and from his experience. Without further ado, Sanjay. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Gadigone sir, Milin sir, Kiran Saudi sir, and uh, my friend Manoj for this opportunity given. Uh, it's really challenging to speak after excellent presentations by Deepak, Tejas, and Amit. And especially when I'll be speaking about some challenging fractures like fracture calcaneal, which is the most common fracture of uh, tarsal bones. It represents 2% of all fractures and it accounts for 60 to 65% of tarsal fractures. Treatment is considerably challenged due to its unique shape, location, and limited soft tissue envelope. Uh, in addition to conservative treatment, uh, where we, uh, which is applicable to most of the patient, open reduction and internal fixation, it restores calcaneal shape, alignment, as well as height. <clears throat> it provides patients with possibility of painless weight bearing in daily activities. However, it has high incidence of complications and lower patient satisfaction. Early complications like hematoma, wound dehiscence, flap, margin necrosis, and in long-term osteomyelitis is, uh, is commonly seen. Outcomes are influenced by patient's age, smoking uh, or tobacco addictions, cause and type of fracture, surgical waiting period, body mass index, surgical asepsis, surgical approach, skin restriction methods, the quality of reduction of bowler's angle, quality of sutures we use, and the implants we use for the surgery. Delayed complications with fracture calcaneum are deformity of the hind foot, distorted hind foot biomechanics, lateral wall widening or prom prominence, peroneal tendon dysfunction or impingement, implant related problems, and very commonly subtalar arthritis. So here is a case as a 27 year gentleman who is a non smoker, with a history of fall from height. In the month of June 2020, he sustained fracture L2 vertebra without narrow deficit. There was combinated fracture of the calcaneum. He was operated for fracture calcaneum elsewhere. elsewhere. Lateral plating was done along with one 4mm carinated cancel screw and one KY. He presented to us 14 months post-index surgery with pain while walking and difficulty in sitting on floor. On examination, he was having antalgic gait. The scars or lateral aspect of ankle, they were healthy, but skin was a bit adhered. There was a reasonable ankle range of motion, but subtalar movements in like inversion and eversion, they were painful. These are the x-rays which were there with patient. These x-rays were taken in the month of June 2020. This fracture L2 was treated conservatively. And this fractured calcaneum with complete depression of the posterior facet of the calcaneum, it was treated with a recon plate, screws, and K wires. So, my our challenges were what approach to take, whether to go for uh, go with the same incision or whether to plan a different incision like sinus tarsi and uh, what to do. Initially, we were thinking whether all symptoms are just because of uh, arthritis or it is peroneal dysfunction. Considering the local skin condition, the adhered status of the skin to the underlying uh, implant and bone, we planned a sinus tarsi approach and this is this wire is marking the upper border of the calcaneum so this is the skin incision the skin incision extending from the tip of the femina is <coughs> of four and fifth metatarsal space between fourth and fifth metatarsal. 
This is how we expose the implant, protect the nerve and tendons inferiorly. We took out screws, posterior screws by small posterior incision and anterior screws and plate. It was removed with the sinus tarsi approach. Then we identified and elevated. We retracted the peroneal tendon and nerve posteriorly, and we identified the extensor digiti minimum muscle. And reflected it with the stay suture. We removed the exostosis on the lateral aspect of calcaneum as well as talus. Expose the subtalar joint. Then with the help of blade number 15, incise the cartilage in a crisscross way for complete derivation. This is the lamina spreader. We also use burr to make the surface even. We could reach posteromedial corner of the posterior facet. Then we introduced a wire from the calcaneum and then took it out through the articular part of the posterior facet, then retrieved, taken it back, retrieved the iliac trace graft, which was 12 millimeter thick. This is the length, which is 16 millimeter, and introduced in this posterior facet or in the subtalar joint, and forwarded the wire into the talus. This is the lateral and calcaneal new CRV images, and then replaced with two 4 mm connected cancellous screws. And this is the final picture. This is immediate post op. This is one month, four months, and now eight months. These are pictures taken five months post surgery. He was having good ankle range of motion. He was doing all his activities. He was having difficulty in doing floor activities, and now he can do that. This is eight months. He has no pain. He walks well. So there are many types of uh, calcaneal malunion described by Stephens and Sanders, of which we considered this to be a type 2 type of malunion where we do where we did removal of exostosis, we did peroneal tenolysis and subtalar bone block arthrodesis, what we call as a distraction block arthrodesis. So to summarize, 
Subtalar fusion is a salvage procedure for post-traumatic subtalar arthritis. Subtalar distraction bone block arthrosis is a technically demanding procedure, but if planned and executed well, it can improve clinical outcome. Clinical outcomes are influenced by smoking and concomitant injury. And acceptable functional outcomes and quality of life can be promised after properly done subtalar fusion. Thank you. Excellent, Sanjay. Thank you very much for the short and sweet presentation. It's a very common, I think, uh, mode of presentation. And may I request uh, Kiran, sir, to please open the with your comments and questions, please. I think the sinus tissue approach is very, very good and non-invasive and is a very good uh, approach uh, for subtalar fusion. And uh, it's a very good presentation and very good reasons. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sanjay, right, sir. Very good operative procedure, and uh, you have done a very wonderful job with so minimum soft tissue injury. Uh, how much time it takes near about for a satellite fusion to occur in a, this type sir, of arthrosis? Sir, in, in this case, almost by five months, patient was absolutely symptom free. Uh, what is, what is your uh, post operative immobilization protocol? Sir, post-operative plaster slab was given for six weeks. Oh. Non-weight bearing. Non-weight bearing, yes, sir. In between, it was removed for stitches in one. That is after two weeks. After two weeks, again, we uh, I asked the patient to come for follow-up, where we took out the plaster, he cleaned, and we reapplied it. So, total six weeks, we had applied uh, plaster. And after that, he was kept non-weight bearing for another four weeks. So total two and a half months of non-weight bearing. Two and a half or three months. Two and a half months in this case. Sir. And uh, plaster for six weeks, non-weight bearing for uh, two and a half months. And then we started partial weight bearing. But by four and four and a half months, he was very comfortably walking. Swelling was there for initial six months. But now uh, there is minimal swelling. And uh, he has no pain. He has good ankle range of motion. Uh, and uh, skin is absolutely normal. Yes, Kiran, sir. No, yes, you sir. use 4 millimeter cannulated screw. So we you sometimes use 6.5 millimeter screws. Sir, if you are using two screws, it is uh, prudent or I think it's more better to use 4 mm screws uh, because uh, medial or later, medial laterally putting two screws would be, you may find it difficult. But certainly, sir, we can we can do that. We can use it. And whether to use washer or not? Not to use washer, sir, because we are uh, operating at a hill. Yeah. And we don't want any additional skin issues. To use washer, you need a larger skin incision. This is yeah. almost a percutaneous uh, fixation. Achha, that will give problem with the skin. Problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even the subtalar, uh, the sinus tarsi approach, even though uh, people they are using it for plating, but it is initially described for minimally uh, invasive reduction of yeah. the posterior facet and percutaneous fixation, and yeah. not open fixation. Even because such in this case, I, I, I was no, I was not having any option because that skin was added, and I didn't, I don't want any uh, skin-related uh, problem. Sanjay, you are a famous uh, foot and ankle surgeon. Also, now they use a. Uh, subtalar <laughs> approach to reduce the fracture and do a percutaneous spinning. Yeah, yeah. So the, there is no problem or issue about it because the collapse of the fracture uh, does not occur per se within uh, three or four uh, K wires are used uh, properly. Right, right. Slightly, I would disagree on one point. Ke, I think the biomechanically the subtalar joint is uh, quite uh, demanding. Only yeah. putting this uh, with this distraction, it might have helped with four to a millimeter CC screws, but I think it would have been a 6.5 or additional screws from the other directions. Is it recommended or what uh, is the idea? Manoj, Manoj, it is not just whether you are using uh, four mm screws or 6.5 mm screws. Certainly, you need two screws for better biomechanics, but it is the preparation of the uh, subtalar joint, like removal of the cartilage making it even as i said reaching the posteromedial corner so with the help of burr you should reach the posteromedial corner of the uh, posterior facet of the subtalar joint and if your preparation is well 
and by the time if you put that graft in you will feel that you don't need even screws sure, yeah right. i think that makes it more stable even with that graft yes, yes. so I, i i think rather than whether to use 4 mm screws or 6 mm screws it is the preparation of the joint uh, which makes sense not only here but in all orthodontic cases great super dr amit you had a you had a point to make please yes sir i have a question to sanjay sir Yes. Okay, what is the minimum duration uh, you should keep if you have taken the first extensor lateral approach and now a second skin incision you want to take a sinusoidal approach that is my first question and second question subtalar joint you are fusing just posterior facet what happens to the anterior facet which is not fused uh, does does it give some pain or something or what what happens to it uh amit uh, very good question the second question i understood well first uh, is that question related to the fresh fracture or for subtalar arthrosis sir for any fracture if you have taken extensor lateral approach previously so what is the minimum duration after which you can take a Ten little days. closer Ten skin days. incision 10 days extensor no, no, no. approach patient is previously operated by extensor l approach okay now you want to take a sinusoidal approach right So, what is the minimum duration you feel that the skin problems will not come if you take a sinusoidal approach in a previously operated patient with extensor L approach? Uh, I mean, this is not uh, duration won't matter. If the local skin condition is all right, you can do it even after six weeks or eight weeks because sinusoidal approach it is associated with lesser wound related complications. as and it has nothing to do with because you are quite away from the extensive uh, approach this is one and secondly as you say, uh, the answer to your second question what happens to anterior uh, part of subtalar joint subtalar fusion per se it means fusion of the posterior facet it has nothing to do with the anterior facet okay so And like if you say subtalar fusion, it means fusion of the posterior facet. Okay. 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 Great. Superb. So this is really a big and common topic. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for uh, highlighting a very simple and very elegantly performed surgery. As usual, you have great results. Learning from you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Now my privilege to invite Dr. Parth Gawatre. a uh, young trauma surgeon at akola who's going to speak to us about trimalleolar fractures and uh, parth is a um, is a graduate is a mumbai boy and he's been a junior consultant at sanjeeti hospital that makes him a pretty all around surgeon and we are privileged to have him with us here in akola uh, can you please share your screen dr parth yes sir thank you sir i'll do it so he has something new that he's going to tell us about uh, trimalleolar fractures and he has a uh, you know quite a nice series but he is going to tell us you know one or two very demonstrative cases yeah great start please so, so good evening everyone uh, thank you milin sir for giving me this opportunity uh, basically it was a very hushus presentation so there might be some lacuna in it uh, i'll be present I'll, i'll be going ahead with the presentation so uh, this is a case this is a trimalleolar fracture the patient was a 27 year old male student and this injury was 12 days old parth may i interrupt yes sir do we call it as a parth uh, this trimalleolar or you can say it's a pylon fracture because there is the intraarticular extension in the middle of the segment of the tibia you can see here there is the syndesmosis separation and uh, posterior translation anterior translation posterior fragment and you can have a very large chunk of a posterior lateral fragment of the uh, tibia which is involved in the articular surface just to wanted to make it clear from you whether we will label it as a trimalleolar fracture or a uh, pylon fracture so it, it is a pylon fracture but just uh, the presentation was all about to highlight regarding the split posterior tri posterior malleolus fragments and how to go about the fixation of this fragments so uh, it was all, all about that that's why i tried to label it as a trimalleolar fracture with split posterior malleolus good good so this was the pre op x ray and the patient uh, at presentation had this uh, clinical image so there was a deep abrasion here deep contusion abrasion on the anteromedial aspect of the ankle uh, 
uh, and the joint was subluxated at presentation and it was already 12 days old so i did a ct so these are the ct images this is a coronal plane ct image of the same patient and in this in this uh, transverse plane you can see that the posterior malleus has got a large posterior medial fragment as well and a large posterior lateral fragment this was the sagittal plane image this was the 3d reconstruction image of the same patient so here you can appreciate that the medial malleus there is a small, small transverse medial malleolar fragment along with this posterior medial uh, fragment and a large posterior lateral fragment so i all, before before uh, starting with the surgery i always try to get a contralateral x ray of the uh, opposite normal ankle to have a proper view so that we try to reconstruct it in the same manner because there are variations uh, that you can see in the tibia fibular clear space and so uh, there should not be any confusion regarding that that's why it is better to get a contralateral x ray uh, before starting with the surgery so this was the contralateral x ray of the normal ankle uh, these were some intra operative images sorry to put it uh, put all the images in one slide but there was uh, less time available that's why i had to do it in a very hush hush manner so the first image shows that the uh, fibula fracture was reduced and then it was plated posterior laterally in the second image you can see the posterior uh, posterior malleolus was uh, fixed with the buttress plate uh, in the images in the lo uh, lower images you can see that the medial malleolus was the, uh, small medial malleolar fragment was there and there was a large posterior malleolus posterior medial malleolar fragment so the sequence of fixation was this initially the fibula was fixed in uh, through posterior lateral approach then uh, the medial malleolus posterior malleolus was provisionally fixed with k wires after getting the uh, uh, ankle reduced and getting the uh, pylon reduced it was fixed with k wire provisionally and later on it was buttressed with a this is this is a this is by the way an anatomical fibula distal fibula plate which sits very nicely on the posterior malleolus so i will always tend to use this plate instead of the uh, usual t plate uh, so this was the final image of fixation in which another uh, another uh, one third tibular plate uh, another recon plate was used for the fixation of posterior medial uh, malleolar fragment and the medial malleolus was fixed with tbw this was the skin closure i tried to bypass that uh, deep abrasion so these were his follow up images and this is now five months post op image so you can see nice consolidation joint line is uh, the mortise is uh, parallel and symmetrical there is uh, union at all the three uh, fragments these are his clinical images now plantar flexion and dorsiflexion thank you parth did you check for the sid dysmorphism in your extremity uh, i checked uh, after fixation of the uh, posterior malleolus i checked for the sid dysmorphism uh, by trying to pull the fibula but it was not opening that's why i i i avoided the fixation of sid dysmorphism it was on table the plan was to fix the sid dysmorphism but then in the end when i found it to be stable i avoided it yeah but in the comparative x ray which you have taken on the other side there is a good overlap of this fibula on this endosmosis and which was not there on this your post op x rays so, there so is still the overlap you can see the contralateral x ray if you see yeah it should have been a good overlap of this fibula towards this side and certainly in the mortise view as well you can appreciate some diastasis 
and uh, pre operatively as well i think uh, the it was completely the uh, there was uh, there has to be some syndesmotic injury parth if you notice it very carefully you have done a perfect job except i i am not very happy about this fixation of his syndesmosis because it has a syndesmosis injury you can see here there is a inter uh, uh, this distance intracell distance i think it has increased here as well as there is a uh, yeah, but the, so usual how you have to compare it with the normal also it can, you can see but it looks obviously but and once and once you fix the posterior malleolus there is no need of syndesmosis no yes sir yes sir exactly the point no if there no, is is ligament not is not injured for the posterior side but what about anterior injury so actually we have to look for both and actually sometime majority of the time we fix the posterior malleolus and uh, that the ligamentous and osseous complex is attached to the fibula therefore it provides stability but in a such as complex injury possibly you may get a anterior tibio fibular ligament injury and therefore there is a partial rupture still remains so that is a just a presumption and for sake of discussion i don't say that it has but uh, i think still uh, we have to uh, take a stress x ray uh, of this patient and then we can go to the conclusion because his gait is not uh, as normal as you see in the normal it is a plano valgus uh, if you can see the gait of this patient uh, uh, am i correct manoj uh, yes sir this uh, certainly seems to be pre op as well as uh, there is some uh, post op diastasis in syndesmosis which needs to be addressed but he has tested intraoperatively i think uh, yes sir it yes. was uh, done hmm. But the anterior, the posterior column for the syndesmosis was shattered, and certainly anterior column was intact. But uh, mostly, it should point out towards the syndesmotic injury, even for me as well in this case. <coughs> and another point which I wanted to make is that rather using this uh, anatomical fibula plate posteriorly, it has to be a white T-shaped kind of plate so as to buttress the whole fragment. Uh, usually, even I use the distal radius plate here as well. Yeah, in small so, fragment. Yeah, yeah. uh it has to be wide uh, because it's a point tip uh, coverage which are giving uh, for this fracture with this plate rather than you need to have a wide coverage uh, of the t uh, to cover that big fragment big chunk uh, posteriorly so what I, what i found is the edge of the distal edge of the t plate remains very prominent and uh, uh, it doesn't sit over, it doesn't buttress that well this is what this is what is my observation and opinion and because the fragment was small i could adequately buttress it with this plate so i didn't find that issue here in this case in this particular case hey once the apex is press then there is no problem apex of the fracture yes sir so actually it is a nice surgery uh, yeah part. only there was a issue still i think uh, when you do a such type of a surgery better to put a one screw inside and that is a better option so that uh, whether it is there or not by putting a one screw supramalleolar uh, does not matter much and it should be, it should be done i think so manoj barobar hai gaade ko nahi this yes. fibular screw uh, that can be used no or uh, that can be for, from the plate through also you can yeah, yeah. through plate uh, 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 you need to you need to adjust that plate uh, before and so as to uh, uh, align your this screw uh, before only so that uh, that uh, plate would allow it and nowadays even this syndesmotic this button are available very easily yeah, yeah. you uh, you can uh, put those across uh, get a good anchorage on uh, the medial side and just tight the that uh, tight rope kind of mechanism and you can get that reduction uh, without additional implant which needs to be removed later on so this is the take home message is only that after doing a, having a, such a wonderful surgery also a one step that is to be completed last is the proper syndesmosis diagnosis and if uh, needed a surgical intervention it's very super case. thank you thank, thank you, you professor gadigone thank you parth thank for you, this uh, very nice case it was very kind of you to you know join in at the last moment and you've done a great job and uh, thank you for participating and showing this really well done a slightly new configuration and uh, we all enjoyed it very much thank you so much thank and you, thank now you. my privilege to uh, okay you can please unshare your screen yes sir uh, i now like to invite the last speaker for today uh, dr ishani saudhari 
She is a junior consultant at Saudhri Hospital. She's from KM Hospital and Sanchiti Hospital. She's worked at GMC Akola and recently joined us as a junior consultant. She'll be uh, speaking to us on a new type of high tibial osteotomy known as a focal dome condylar osteotomy, which is specially the newest, latest osteotomy, which combines intra and extra articular osteotomies both. Without further ado, over to you, Dr. Ishani. Please start sharing. You may start your presentation. Thank you very much. And a very good evening, everyone. Thank you. And I'm very honored to be a part of this silver edition of Silver Jubilee edition of the MOA's Young Surgeons Forum. Uh, jumping straight to the topic, high tibial osteotomy is a very well established knee reconstruction procedure for medial compartment osteoarthritis. In mild virus conditions with extraarticular deformities, are very well treated with open wedge and closed wedge high tibial osteotomies. But it's known that the angular, angulation correction axis is far away from the fora in these cases. Slowly, it was realized the challenges in these cases were that there was a translational deformity, a change in the orientation of the adjacent joints, that is the knee and the ankle joint, and a change in the limb length. To take care of the intraarticular deformities leading to medial compartment osteoarthritis, the TCVO or the tibial condylar valgus osteotomy was done to correct the virus by elevation of the medial tibial condyle and then fixed the plate. This corrected the intraarticular parameters like the joint line convergence angle, the spine vertical distance, and the spine edge angle. But it was seen that it undercorrected the mechanical axis. Now, to address this, Igarashi et al. described the procedure of focal dome condylar osteotomy in 2020, which we soon took up to deal with intraarticular deformities leading to medial condylar, uh, medial MCOA. Now, in the Journal of Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction, an article was published to show our results and compare the findings of F corrections with FDCO as well as TCBO, which was published in 2020. I'd like to share one of the cases which underwent focal dome condylar osteotomy. Now, here's a 45-year-old male who presented with bilateral knee pain. He also had dynamic varus. And after examination and investigation, we found it was medial compartment osteoarthritis with intraarticular deformity leading to the arthritis. For him, sharing the surgical details, now, it's in, now, FDCO is indicated in symptomatic MCOA, which is more than grade 2. First, we check the laxity under the C-arm, clinically as well as the image intensifier. An 8 to 10 centimeter longitudinal incision is taken from the anteromedial parapatellar portal to, to the anteromedial tibial cortex. Dissection is done in such a way that the tendons so the pest, basically the tendons of the semitendinosus and the gracilis are incised. Further, the superficial MCL and the underlying periosteum is partially elevated with a Cobb's elevator to expose the posteromedial tibia. The patellar retinacular release is done to take care of the patellofemoral pain. When you are exposing the posterior aspect of the tibial periosteum, it's very important to take care uh, of the neurovascular structures. Here you can see the underlying periosteum being taken care of and the PM soft tissue release being done. A previously planned Cora is, uh, is wire is inserted after checking in the CM. A 3mm Cora wire is inserted but anterior to posteriorly as the center of the dome osteotomy. Another wire parallel to the patellar tendon and uh, in lateral to the patellar tendon and parallel to the Cora wire is inserted. Vertical osteotomy is done with a recip saw and an osteotome and checked for completion in the CR. And while cutting the uh, posterior cortex, one needs to be careful. Next, using a jig, the medial dome osteotomy is done with a K wire reciprocating saw as well as osteotome from the tibial tuberosity extending medial up to the superficial MCL. Make sure to, con uh, to complete the osteotomy. Now, before opening the osteotomy, 1.2 mm wires are passed to protect the lateral tibial cortex 
from just below the lateral joint line up to the uh, laterally to the vertical limb of the osteotomy two wires are inserted percutaneously medially and laterally to uh, prevent the spread of the medial lateral condyles and to open uh, and a hinge now gentle manual force is given using the spreader uh, the osteotomy site is opened mechanical axis is checked under cm and the grid and once satisfactory correction is done then the osteotomy is fixed to the plate first the proximal row screws are fixed and then all the distal screws are fixed all of them are locking screws if needed autologous bone graft can be used with the osteophytes here the check uh, checking the osteotomy site as well as the fixation is done under cm and manually and patellofemoral hemostasis is done closure is done and with a drain as you can see now patient is mobilized early with a range of motion toe touch weight bearing and then partial weight bearing proceeding to full weight bearing within 6 to 9 weeks these were the results of the patient with good alignment pain relief and range of motion these were his post operative x rays and healing is seen at the osteotomy site as well as the correction of the mechanical axis this is the comparison of the patient this was the great gate pre operatively where there was dynamic varus which can be seen and post operatively where there was no dynamic varus the alignment was restored as the pain was taken care of so in conclusion uh, the focal dome condylar osteotomy is a single osteotomy which has a vertical intraarticular arm and a medial dome which takes care of both the intraarticular aspect as well as a large varus and when compared to its sibling which is the tcvo the core of the fdco lies at the lateral tibial spine and can help with larger mechanical axis deviation thank you okay thank you dr ishani uh, i now open this director uh, please you may uh, ishani fantastic presentation of focal dome uh, osteotomy i want thank a small you. comment you are a left handed surgeon uh no sir the so the thing is that it the video has been switched acha otherwise yes. i just wanted to tell all left handed surgeons are very good like elenora <laughs> rm kandak <laughs> yes sir okay very good presentation thank you sir yeah ishani can you stop sharing this yes ishani as you join you have uh, done a wonderful job of presenting and you are under the master's hand yeah. you, the, your guru is a excellent man and therefore uh, the product is also excellent and i think uh, you are presenting very nicely you have a very bright future and uh, mm -hmm. you will do such a good work in future also and whenever i will get an opportunity i will give a chance to present on a higher and higher platform thank you very much sir. very honored so few comments uh, i think uh, ishan it was a wonderful excellent uh, presentation it's like uh, this is a new kid and the block like this osteotomy and certainly yes. gaining the momentum but i think uh, the maculis line in your preoperative is certainly well within the joint it hasn't crossed the medial joint so it has to be done in i think severe deformities only if i feel uh, this deformity can routinely be corrected this much deformity can routine hto with the tomo fix plate which you use and uh, there has to be certain indication only going for this uh, osteotomy i suppose so lisa uh, thank you for pointing it out in fact in this patient uh, the mechanical axis was pretty much mild it was within 25 uh, percent however what was happening was the the component was the intraarticular deformity and the large medial lateral laxity which indicated that it was the intraarticular deformity uh, that is why we chose to do the fdco in this case um for taking care of the intraarticular component definitely fdco can take care of larger deformities for sure i would just add that uh, you know we also before surgery we took a single legged full length x ray yeah i think the yeah. mechanical axis was close to zero 
as opposed to the bipedal full length x-ray we showed that the mechanical axis preoperatively is only at about 20% or so yeah. so yes you are right prima facie if you look at the bipedal full length yes only a medial opening wedge should do the job but he had significant mediolateral laxity even the video doesn't do justice and uh, uh, so with a large deformity and the intra articular component there is a teeter totter effect and one condyle is you know in touch at one time so the need to correct the intra articular component you know if the medial component condyle is depressed we we elevate this yeah. and so both of the condyles get in touch with both the femoral condyles at the same time and that improves the stability and that is the rationale for both the tcv and the fdco yeah i think the pagoda kind of uh, the proximal uh, the tibial condyles would be better and right. uh, sir what is your experience of this uh, tibial tuberosity getting shifted with this osteotomy are there any mechanical problems uh, of instability this patient will have yes very very uh, very astute question actually the the in tcvo the medial condyle is elevated the vertical limb of the osteotomy is medial to the patellar ligament and the rest of the distal tibia is in continuity with the patellar uh, tendon and the tibial tuberosity in fdco the vertical limb is lateral to the patellar ligament and you know so uh, you have a very thin proximal part of the tibia but the, there is no alteration of the patellofemoral mechanics that's what's happening whereas you are improving the congruity of the intraarticular component so it it saves one of the problems with the the moment you cross 8 or 9 degrees of correction with the medial opening wedge and when the mpta after surgery goes beyond 95 degrees it places greater strains on the patellofemoral joint as well as the acl and this it also in worsens the knee joint line orientation makes the knee joint line oblique and the ankle joint line oblique with slightly corrections larger than 7 8 or 9 degrees or 10 degrees and if you carefully look at the medial lateral laxity in every patient just before starting surgery we come across this situation frequently so we find more and more that people require intra articular osteotomies billion you mean uh, that the medial lateral laxity is better uh, addressed by this type of osteotomy yes sir medial lateral laxity and clinically they come with this lateral thrust gait which was visible yeah. in this patient on the left side and a single leg stands full length x ray gives a better picture of the mechanical axis deviation than the bipedal stance so that is deviation of whole weight on the one limb therefore there is a uh, weight bearing x ray better uh, with the single stance yeah yes and it it simulates the uh, dynamic condition of while walking and so if it tcvo we were finding we did about 50 or 60 of these we found that the congruity of the joint improves there is good pain relief but the mechanical axis is not getting corrected well beyond 50% so in many patients we have added a second osteotomy and used an elisaro fixator that has given very good correction of the axis as well but then there is a fixator wear which is not you know perfect for a lot of older patients so this osteotomy is very exciting because it has answered both the issues of intra articular and extra articular correction with a single osteotomy and we are going to so this is so new this is from kanazawa university published in 2020 i was in kanazawa university in 2019 so i was you know we started doing this within one or two months of their publishing and we are very pleased with the results of this procedure with what with the standard tomofix plate in older ladies with large deformities we are able to get good joint congruity as well as mechanical axis correction and this has been presented in llrs north america by the kanazawa university group and it is going to see a lot of use in the coming few yeah. you know months and years so a quick question for you so have you stopped using elisaro for estos nowadays with the good availability of this uh, the anatomical this tomofix or this peak kind of plates yes it's a very interesting question 
our use of the elizaro fixator for high tibial osteotomy is now reduced to only 10 to 15% of the cases we reserve it for those patients who have a large deformity combined with what we call as a tertiary deformity meaning that there is a rotation of the tibia or there is a leg length discrepancy sometimes in polio patients the polio limb is short and the normal opposite limb undergoes a lot of varus forces and that limb is longer so we use the elizaro fixator to shorten the arthritic normal limb as well as to bring it into valgus and derotate so tertiary deformities or large varus without medial lateral laxity without an intraarticular component so we may use the elizaro in younger or in diabetic patients or we may use the elizaro temporarily in the surgery and fix it with a plate so yes the ro role of the elizaro has come down yes, dramatically so it was a excellent presentation ishani yeah congratulations so i look forward to some comments from uh, kiran sir you know fantastic presentation by akola orthopedic society uh, deepak malokar for distal radius then irreparable cuff repair by tejas then amit jado non union uh, for femur and tibia sanjay sonone fantastic presentation calcaneum non union uh, and uh, parth for ankle injuries and ishani fantastically that osteotomy so all these cases are really rare and uh, complicated cases and very good results and very good presentation from your society thank you for your presentation for all the faculty members over to dr gade gone thank you sir so in the meanwhile uh, uh, dr manoj can you would you like to comment about the entire you know show put up by our young and dynamic yes, members sir. Uh, so i think it was a wonderful uh, thing to have uh, very fortunate to have akala orthopedic society as this silver jubilee edition and uh, all the speakers were very crisp on time to the point and good take home messages at the end of his session and we could certainly generate a very good discussion many learning points were there and uh, all the the speakers were uh, quite expert in their own fields and uh, we could certainly have a good meeting today and it was one of the best episode i could say uh, continuous uh, interactive about, uh, we need to be attentive for uh, all the cases for today i think and uh, you have moderated it so nicely and uh, uh, all these i must congratulate all the speakers and akola orthopedic society Uh, for being with uh, YSA for this episode. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Manoj. N now you know why I am a very proud member of Akola Orthopedic Society. Absolutely, sir. It has to be. <laughs> no, I know all these people. I think uh, Sanjay. You are proud member of our all societies, all India yes. level, not only yes. Akola. <laughs> yes, sir. Especially so. Uh, you know, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. even though it was a short notice our youngsters really did a great job in putting together small but very interesting presentations at short notice and they've done justice to the topics uh, i thank again dr vasudev gadegone sir the president dr kiran sauji dr manoj pahukar uh, and maharashtra orthopedic association not the least ortho tv Dr. Ashok Sham and Neeraj Neeraj Bijlani, I thank very much. Dr. Deepak Malokar, Dr. Tejas Waghela, Dr. Amit Jadhav, Dr. Sanjay Sonone, Dr. Parth Gawatre, and Dr. Ishani Saudhari for participating and you know giving us all a very good time. Thank you all so very kind of. And last word, thank you very much, Milin, for a wonderful uh, coordination of our your junior colleague and wonderful cases. and everybody is excellent excellent and excellent excellent yeah hello thank you very much thank you very much good night thank, thank you everyone thank, thank, thank you have a wonderful night everyone yeah thank Happy you people. thank you thank you thank you, thank you all thank you everyone bye bye thank you everyone bye bye